Hey, Austin. Uh, today, we have an author, magician, host of Scam School, the only show dedicated to social engineering at the bar and on the street, and now hack the hacking the system on the National Geographic channel. Let's give a big, warm Google Austin welcome to Brian Brushwood. All right. Wow. That was a, what a response. <laughs> All right. Uh, Howdy guys, my name is Brian Brushwood. Um, uh, uh, real quick, hands in the air if any of you guys have seen any of the projects that I've done. Uh, okay, great, this is great. Uh, five years ago when somebody asked who, who I was and what I did, it was very, very simple. My job is I am a touring full-time stage performer who dabbles on the internet here and there. Things have changed over the last half decade. Uh, nowadays I host a show on National Geographic, uh, you know, uh, Scam School is one of the top 1,000 most subscribed channels on all of YouTube. Uh, but I wanted to kind of talk about where everything began. And uh, where it began was right here. This is a photo of me and the magician uh, Teller from Penn and Teller standing on the exact spot where 20 years before I originally started street performing. Uh, at the age of 19, 20 years old, I, I had a vague sense that I wanted to be like Penn and Teller. I wanted to be like Harry Anderson. I wanted to be a traveling, touring stage performer, but no sense of how to get there. And so instead, I... Uh, I, I met Penn and Teller after one of their shows. They're very approachable. I, I encourage you to watch your show and, and go up and meet with them afterwards. And I made the joke to uh, Teller. I said, hey, uh, you know, sign this card. Make it out to my bastard son. And uh, he thought that was funny enough that we struck up a brief conversation. And I found out later that I had been added onto his email list. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I have Teller's email address. Of course, this is the mid-90s, and the very novelty of email was, was exciting. Uh, and four times I started to write a letter to my hero and I couldn't figure out how to begin. Uh, I didn't want to sound like just another fan. I assumed that he gets emails like this all the time. I wanted to stand out and I wanted to get real advice from him. And then one day in a fit of, of random rage, I wrote this uh, with the subject heading of fury. And I wrote a letter to Teller talking about how angry I was at him not for being brilliant, not for being original, not for being uh, extraordinary, but because he got there first. And I realized that because he got there first, I could never be the kind of magician I wanted to be without looking like a shabby Penn and Teller knockoff. One of the bits of advice that I had read from them in, in, a, in a article in, I want to say, G Genie Magazine, they say, don't, when you are writing your material, don't be inspired by something you love. If you are inspired by something that you love, the best you will be is a pale, shabby imitation of whatever that thing is. So instead, be inspired by what you hate. Go see a bunch of crappy magic shows, figure out exactly what you hate about all of them, and then be the exact opposite. Now you are something truly original and extraordinary, and, uh, and, and you, you've made your own space in the universe. So I wrote him, uh, I don't know, just give him a hard time, and writing the email was cathartic. It was, I felt this weight off. I was like, oh, look at me. I, I feel like I expressed my, my rage. I'm 19. And the next morning, to my utter surprise, Teller wrote a four and a half page essay in response on the nature of creativity. By the way, just look up Brian Brushwood Teller letter if you want to read the entire thing. And in it, he talks about he says, there's one line that really sticks out in my mind. He says, uh, take your best stab and keep on stabbing. If it's in you, it's going to come out. And what I took away from that is uh, that I needed to put myself in a position to discover what was inside me. And what I discovered is that um, uh, street performing seemed like a good place to begin. It's something that uh, nobody could tell you no. Uh, the worst case scenario is people turn around and walk away. And if you're really lucky, you get $50 of beer money by the end of the night. Uh, unfortunately, here in Austin, they don't have an established uh, hierarchy or, or, or permitting system for street performing, or they didn't at the time. And so I actually uh, noticed that this, uh, this souvenir shop on 6th Street has a two-foot wide strip. It used to be a jewelry shop that would close in the evenings. And I figured out that if I was on the public sidewalk, I was illegally performing without a permit. But if I was on this two-foot strip, I was only trespassing. And if I was only trespassing, then they could only chase me off if, if it was the private property owners, or at least that's what I told myself. And over this time, I learned a bit about ugh, when you put yourself out there, when you try to share what's in your heart, when you try to have some kind of art out there, uh, turns out you're going to deal with people who don't like it. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from the, the opening remarks here is that you should love your trolls. 
Uh, I started off not loving my trolls. I learned when I was street performing that the way you get someone to shut the hell up is shine just enough spotlight on them that they feel a fraction of the fear that I feel on stage performing. I realized that if I wanted to keep going with my narrative, what I needed to do was turn the entire rest of the audience against that one person. Uh, and, and, and you learn, you know, you learn zingers. In many ways, doing any kind of variety performer is like living the life of, uh, of, of Groundhog Day. You do the same show. It doesn't matter where you are, what situation you're in, you're in. for that one hour, it's always the same, same stage. It's always the same audience. It's always the same situations. Whenever you see a, a, a seasoned variety performer have a quick zinger, it is not because they were very quick on their feet. The reason was three years ago, someone heckled him with the exact same line, and four days afterwards, he was like, son of a bitch, that's what I should have said. And he filed it away, right? So, and it's very comforting, it's very soothing to, to kind of have this idea that no matter how bad one show goes, you know that down the road, you can try again. And uh, so after, uh, I guess, uh, performing on the street for a little bit, I moved indoors and I started performing at a little venue called the Electric Lounge, where I would do the same 15 minute set and then pass the hat. Uh, and I started touring to colleges nationwide. And I had a moment so, some lessons come to you early on. You have an idea for what kind of outrageous stunt you want to pull. And then other things take longer to, to you know, realize. And in this case, uh, I, I was at Davis and Elkins College in West Virginia. And I did not connect with that audience. My show was meant to be a sarcastic, almost middle finger, middle finger parody of what at the time was the bedazzled, sequined wearing, you know, uh, 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 fans blowing your David Copperfield hair kind of magic show. And it turns out that the exact thing I was mocking was what that crowd really wanted to see. And at the end of the show, I walked off stage and somebody threw fruit at my stage. I did not know that this was a real thing. Like, I, I, I walk off and all of a sudden there's just a slam and I turn around just in time to see orange uh, juice, you know, slam, sliming down over one of my props. And it occurred to me, I was like, why is it that I'm not connecting with this audience? And then this, uh, this happened. Uh, this is a statement that I never thought I was going to make. Uh, later, the next year, I toured with Brooks and Dunn, Rascal Flatts, and Brad Paisley, is a thing that actually happened. Uh, and we, they set up something called the Neon Circus Stage. It was like a midway, and I would do uh, you know, my punk rock magic. I would shove tubes up my nose, pull it out of my mouth. I would hammer a four and a half inch nail in my nose. I'd have blood and guts everywhere. But one of the best things that came out of all this was, uh, oh, we had our own tour bus. It was amazing. Um, that's me giving the middle finger, sorry. Uh, Straight Jacket Escape. Uh, this guy right here, is a na his name is uh, Dennis Rogers. And he, at the time, I thought was so, so, so wrong. Dennis Rogers is a former world champion arm wrestler who has a supreme gift. He has unbelievably dense muscle tissue. If you touch his forearm, it is like touching a brick. His, his act consists of stuff like taking a, a frying pan and rolling it up like he's rolling a newspaper. He'll take a uh, wrench you know, that you'll do your best to, to even make a dent in, and he just bends it like it's nothing. He bends iron spikes. He is legitimately phenomenally gifted in strength. And yet, I saw him in this environment where you get a bunch of people, that, that's the nice thing about uh, street performing or midway performing, is that it's the most artistically pure venue I can think of because nobody's there to see you. Nobody showed up because you're there. You have to earn whatever the respect to get people to stop and watch. And there was one show that it drove me nuts because I'm watching Dennis Rogers, who again is legitimately the best in breed with what he does, and I watch him responding, giving power to these trolls, you know, these hecklers, these, there's three or four of these frat boy douchebags sitting there with their red solo cups shouting out that this is fake or that's rigged or whatever. And to me, as the jaded, bitter street performer, I'm like, look, you mock them, turn the audience against them, look them in the eye, say, shut up, and then you get on with your show. And instead, what I watched Dennis do was give them all the power. He came up afterward. He, would, he did his whole show twice, once on stage and again one-on-one -on -one for them, handing over the individual wrenches. Well, like, well, here, go ahead and check out the wrench. You try to bend it. And then, brrr, uh, well, oh, sure, yeah, no, I'll be happy to arm wrestle you. By the way, I'm genuinely a world champion arm wrestler. And at the time, 
I, I was so disappointed because I felt like, oh, Dennis, don't you get it? They're cattle. They need to be moved to the slaughter chute. You need to own this performance. You're better than that. Uh, and it turns out that I was completely wrong, and Dennis is 100% right. Because after, uh, after touring for 15 years with the stage show and getting pretty good at it, um, it turns out that all the rules changed once we launched Scam School. We launched Scam School back in 2008, and it was, I thought at the time that Scam School would be a good first practice round before I got a real TV show, whatever that means. Uh, I thought that uh, you know, a, a simple show about bar tricks and scams would be popular enough, and you know, this will fold like all startups are going to fold, and who cares? And it turns out that here we are you know, seven, eight years later, and, uh, and, and one and a quarter million subscribers. Specifically, uh, when Scam School launched, for the first time, I got a new kind of heckler. Uh, you know, I encountered uh, the troll. Uh, uh, this was, by the way, all of the comments I grabbed. I don't know if you could read any of these, but uh, I grabbed all of these this morning, uh, and they're all taking a dump on my hairstyle at the time of <laughs> whatever. So this is, <laughs> uh, all of a sudden I realized the rules that worked in a live stage performance don't work for trolls. You can't shine a spotlight on them, because that's all they want in the world. You can't turn the audience against them because they don't care what everyone else says. They are doing it for the sheer joy of, in their mind, speaking truth to power or whatever. And I, I went through a number of phases in dealing with trolls. There was times I was defensive, I was argumentative. For a good year, my reply to everyone was just to respond with a link to uh, the Big Lebowski with the dude saying, yeah, well, that's just your opinion, man. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but ultimately, I found myself in the position that nowadays, when I respond, if there's a pat answer, it's with uh, you know, uh, an emoticon, uh, an emoji uh, saying hugs, come on over, you know, hey, check this out, and you'll find out I'm an OK guy. Uh, and that seems to be the most successful thing. Specifically, I, and I, again, I don't know why, but it seems like taking that Dennis Rogers approach of respecting the troll somehow pivots them. It flips them over. And I think about it in terms, there was a, a, a speaker in the college market, and I wish I could remember his name, but he told me, uh, Bruce Lee never ever tried to match force with force. When a punch was coming, he never grabbed it. He would always divert it off to the side. And that's what you get with trolls. You don't worry about when the wind is blowing the wrong direction if you're trying to get across the Atlantic. You worry when there is no wind. And the same energy that, that makes trolls passionate to just scream, I hate your hair, is the exact same thing that by being recognized and listened to can be pivoted into making them one of your biggest fans. And that is exactly what happened with Dennis Rogers and those, uh, those fraternity boys. Uh, and specifically, so one of the things that happened when, when uh, I started street performing is the whole reason I got started was because I knew that I did not have the ability. I did not have the experience to be clever on the fly, to wrap people in, to build a crowd, to establish a connection. And so I needed a safe place to be bad for me to be good. And uh, the, the street was perfect for that. I realized that when Scam School launched, I didn't have the tools. I didn't know how to deal with this new type of trolls. And I, I wanted a passionate, fan-run community. And there was no way I was going to get that five minutes once a week in a one-way conversation. So I turned on a web camera, and I did something I called the BB Live Show for Brian Brushwood BB. Uh, that's my initials. And it was genuinely awful. I go back and I look at it now, and it's miserable. It's awkward. I cringe. You know, it, it's, it's, I'm fidgety. I don't have anything to say. It goes nowhere. And yet, it was a safe place to be bad. Because I could be bad for 80 people at a time. That's the great thing about the internet, is one of two things happen. Either you're spectacularly bad, and you get famous for it, in which case, win. Or you're boring, in which case, nobody watches. In which case, win. Because you got that experience. You got that training. Uh, nowadays, that community has become this, this fully self-sustained community at diamondclub.tv. Uh, uh, we got five different channels that are running. People are providing their own gameplay content. There's a, a living chat room that's alive at all times. And all of this began because I found a safe place to be bad. So whatever your artistic endeavor, I would say find a safe place to be bad so you can be good. 
but also realize that you're going to have difficulties along the way. And in this case, my biggest difficulty, my biggest, loudest heckler, the most miserable day of my life was on, I believe, March 2nd, 2013. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the uh, online forum 4chan? Hands in the air? OK. Uh, they have a bit of re reputation, those guys. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> one day, 4chan says, hey, let's roll some dice. And whoever they roll up on, let's all rush that person's YouTube channel and accuse that person of being a pedophile. Which, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of brilliant. Because it's literally, it's the perfect box. You rush in and you call someone a pedophile, what are they going to say? No, I love children. I have children. Why would you say that? Uh, one of the many sayings associated with 4chan is that they do stuff for the lulls. Uh, meaning it's not personal. We don't actually hate you. We could care less. We just want to want to get a chuckle out of this. So we'll ruin your life. <laughs> and uh, and so sure enough, that day, if you you know, luckily they had grabbed screenshots of it. But uh, apparently they were like, uh, hey, whose life should we ruin with accusations of pedophilia? Somebody's like, um, uh, how about Justin Bieber? Well, let's roll the dice. No, it's not going to be Justin Bieber. Well, what about this guy? He does science demos on YouTube. Well, let's roll the dice. No, it won't be him. And then somebody was like. What about this guy? He does uh, magic on the internet. <laughs> we have a winner. And I, uh, I got a, a uh, oh yeah, we'll do this. Uh, I got a tweet saying, heads up, 4chan raid incoming. And I went and checked out our most recent video. And uh, there was a bit of a traffic spike on it. And all of it being nothing but, but everything you would imagine, just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what this guy did to that girl. I can't believe this. You know, oh, I used to respect this guy. I hope he rots in hell. And you could see that it was very clearly coordinated and it was rolling outward because first it was just the one video, then it was the next video next door, then it was, uh, then it was my Wikipedia page getting uh, vandalized. Uh, and luckily, I happened to be in the middle of a recording session with uh, my co-host, Justin Robert Young, we were recording a comedy album. And I was like, what, what do you do? This is the perfect play. This is the perfect troll. There, there is no response. And Justin nailed it. He says, uh, you have to take the wind out of their sails. Understand, they hold all the power. You hold none of it. The only thing you can do is make it not fun for them to continue going forward. And so we poked around a little bit. We knew that uh, what does the internet respond to? They respond to effort. They respond to honesty. They respond to directness. They respond to respect. And what we ended up doing, I hope, I hope I'm still connected to the internet. I was going to, let me see if I can throw this on here. You guys can not see that, apparently. Um, there we go. So this is an advertisement that I'm going to talk over the entire time. Uh, you know what? We did not uh, think about audio side of things. So I'm going to turn this up, and hopefully you can pick it up. And actually, what I'll do is I'll set this down over here. So here's what we ended up putting, putting together. Uh, it was something that was out of nowhere with virtually no preparation. And I wanted to show respect and make it not fun. So this is what we did. And I will click refresh, and we will watch another ad. No, oh, 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 oh. Hang on, let me back this up. I don't know if we can, do, do we have audio? Or I, you know what, I'll just lay this down. How about that? There we go. Boom. And look at me. Oh, hello, Internet. Today is a momentous occasion, because after five years and nearly 300 episodes of Scam School, we've finally gotten big enough to attract the attention of 4chan. That's right, 4chan, that lovable group of rapscallions who stir up trouble on the Internet. And today, I was the lucky lottery winner of a honest-to-goodness slash B pedo bomb. This is where everyone gets together. Give me my award. I won fair and square. There we go. Boom. That's a slash B champion right there. So they come in and they, everyone calls you a pedophile. But here's the important thing, and I mean this sincerely. Thank you, because we need the views very, very badly. Big, big fan. The views, great. Pedophile comments, not so great. But the views, I'm OK with. I want to thank 4chan for considering me. I want to thank Chat Realm for marking all those comments as spam. Feel free to keep on doing that. But most importantly, and I mean this to you, 4chan, I need to know, sincerely, like, 
were you able to feel, figure out the puzzle challenge? Because I thought it was pretty good. Like, the first one was pretty easy. It was in The Simpsons. But the second one, I, don't, I, I thought that one would have gotten you for sure. Oh, subscribe and comment. All right. So uh, uh, I don't know if you could see the, the doe-eyed terror in my face. Uh, but the, that was definitely uh, absolutely terrifying. Um, my favorite, uh, it, it, here's what I did not expect to have come out of that. Uh, the main things I wanted to do were to let our fans know that there is a thing happening, to tell the truth about what it is, but most of all, to love, honestly love and show respect for the people as they're shouting these horrible things at me. And it seemed to work. And again, that's not an invitation for anyone to start another one of these. But um, uh, that's, I guess that's, that's all I really wanted to say. Uh, so so let's, let's, let's pull everything out and see if you guys have any questions. I, I know we're about, to, what, 30 minutes in here? Uh, yeah. You guys, uh, let's, let's open everything up for Q&A. Uh, love your trolls is all I'm trying to say. Who's got questions? Um, so this is what you do full time? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the funny part. What's, what, what is full time? You know, is it the stage performing? At some point, touring you know, doing 150 college shows a year became a day job for me, and doing internet stuff in the evening became the, uh, uh, the, the, the side project for fun. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you pick up a TV show, and all of a sudden that becomes your new day, day job. But I guess the short answer is yes. So how many, like, YouTube videos per week or per month do you have to create in order to... It'd keep the lights on? Yeah. 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 Well, it, de it depends. That the nice thing about YouTube is that it's a platform that allows you to very, very cheaply cr uh, create content. And if you're splitting the paycheck one way, there's not a whole lot that you need to do. You just press record and you talk into a mic. Uh, Scam School is fairly uh, elaborately produced. So we need, uh, you know, we need a sound guy. We need a couple of editors, uh, shooters. So it becomes more expensive. Uh, right now, we've settled in with Scam School being regular content once a week, and we have two spin-off shows, uh, Behind the Scam and Scam School Remix, that uh, along with uh, partnerships uh, for promotions, we're able to get enough to keep like a three-man team sustained uh, where it's worth it to invest the time to do it. I, I don't know if that answers your question. But we're finally to a point where the pie is big enough that we could support three people uh, full time. And, uh, and that ended up being three videos per week. And we're hoping to expand even more from there. Any other questions? Uh, how about uh, what, are there any new platforms like after YouTube launch that you think are like good places to sort of uh, be bad so that you can become good? Yeah, nowadays I would say uh, Periscope is a fantastic, or Meerkat. Basically, in many ways, what we're seeing right now is a reboot of what we saw in the live stream space exactly six years ago. It used to be that uh, you know, Ustream and Justin.tv were the big easy ways to jump in, and, uh, and nowadays that's kind of come full circle, and nowadays you have it on your phone. And so it's amazing what happens, like right now, I'm looking at you guys, you're looking at me. This is a very real moment. I'm 100% dialed in and present. It's amazing what happens when you watch that viewer count rise up in front of you because you can picture the room. And it's like, I know what it looks like to perform for 30 to 40 people at a time uh, in a room. And when, whenever I see currently watching 30 to 40, I picture exactly that room. And I picture trying to hold everybody's interest uh, exactly that hard puts you in a totally different headspace. So I would say definitely a safe place to be bad, especially because Meerkat and Periscope, you know, it only gets saved if you want it to be saved. And that's a, that's a precious and rare commodity nowadays. Yeah. After the uh, four and a half page response from Teller, did you ever have an opportunity to get into another conversation with him? Like what was, yeah. what was that response? As, as a matter of fact, it was, it was astonishing because, you know, like I said, just writing the letter meant a lot to me, but instead, you get this extraordinary journey about what, it, you know, about how, one of the things he says in there is that the heart of all great magic is surprise. And the way he phrased it was beautiful. He said, put two and two in front of me, convince me it's five, then reveal the truth, four, and blow me away. Uh, it ended up kicking off a correspondence. Every time I had a new routine, I would record VHS tapes back in the day and mail them over. And I was always astonished that he took the time to watch them and he gave thoughtful responses. Uh, as a matter of fact, I recently uh, was on uh, Penn & Teller's show uh, Fool Us, 
and a bunch of people were a little bit, dis or I, I would say some fans are, were disappointed because they wanted me to uh, try harder to fool Penn and Teller. And what I, you know, what I couldn't really say to most of them was that, uh, fool us, Brian Brushwood, there we go. Uh, what I couldn't say is that I don't think there's a single stage act in my entire show that, uh, that Teller hasn't had a personal hand in helping me write, you know, whether it's giving feedback or uh, uh, giving a interpretation or, you know, an unusual uh, theatrical spin on. So it occurred to me that if I was not going to fool Penn and Teller, because you can't fool Dad uh, when he taught you everything you know, uh, what I was going to do was play to the audience and instead, you know, figure out how to find moments of uh, to step outside the, the rules for any given performance. So in this case, what I did was we took a bill from the guy from the audience, we chopped it up, and again, this is not rocket science from a magic perspective, but what I love about this routine is that I actually make an individual from the audience eat the burnt ashes of his own selected signed bill, and there is no trick. It is all designed to take advantage of social pressure. The first thing I say is I need someone from the audience who's willing to do absolutely anything. And whoever stands up and goes, whoop, and then it's like, you, get on up here. And then uh, you know, we have them select the bill, we, we burn it up, and then I chop it up and I mix it with his choice, either applesauce or pudding, so he now has a small investment. And as I'm mixing, there's this great moment that I say, hey, do me a favor, just taste it, just taste it. Again, I'm not asking him to do anything crazy. I say, just taste this. So now he's tasted it, and he's on stage, and all of a sudden, that's when it's like checkmate. Then I'm like, do me a favor, just polish this off. Something amazing is going to happen. The faster you eat, the louder they're going to clap. Watch. And then all of a sudden, the audience is cheering, and he realizes that there's no getting out of this, and he actually does eat it. And then we go on to, a, uh, you know, to, to pull him apart. But, but again, the whole reason that I wanted to do this particular routine was not to fool. People think that the power in magic is in the mystery or the, you know, the, in the gap of me knowing how it's done and you not. Uh, that could not be farther from the truth, in my opinion. Uh, there is no mystery when we watch a concert pianist. We know exactly what's happening. They press the key, a hammer strikes a uh, wire that's tuned to a frequency, and he just does all of it in an exquisitely beautiful, heart-wrenching, tear-inducing symphony, right? Uh, Magic is the same thing. If anybody loved magic as much as I love magic, then, uh, and they knew just as much as I did, then, uh, then all that means is that magic would become the number one art on the planet and the most popular thing for everyone to do. I, I, th I think I may have talked a little bit around your question, but, but, but I hope I got, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Teller and I have had an exquisite uh, uh, journey over these years. This correspondence has been amazing and I hope to uh, get to share more of that stuff. Any other questions? I'll, I'll do one on Scam School. Uh, sure. Which episode would you say was the one you're most proud of, and which one would you say was the most fun to make? Maybe that's the same one. No, they're definitely not the same one. In fact, the one I'm most proud of was, in every way, the most miserable one to make. Uh, but I'm most proud of it because it got performed on the International Space Station by uh, video game legend Richard Garriott, AKA Lord British. Uh, he, uh, turns out R Richard Garriott lives here in Austin. Uh, as a kid, I was a tremendous fan of his Ultima series, you know, Ultima 3 Exodus, playing it when I was in third grade. Uh, and uh, we, I had an idea for a magic routine that you could use YouTube as a method for the trick. So what we did was uh, <laughs> we recorded 104 different versions of a fake interview on, on YouTube. And you guys can, you, you could still look this up. In fact, we should probably do a remix episode on it. But what happens is, is you say to someone like, hey, uh, I don't know if you believe in mind control, not like this, this crazy, crazy like voodoo stuff. Uh, in fact, we'll, we'll do it with you. What's your name? Susie. Susie, okay. I don't believe in ESP or mind reading and stuff, but I do believe that there's ways to kind of psychologically nudge people in the right direction. And I was watching this show, there was this interview, there was this crazy like life coach, doctor, expert, who said that he could cause someone to think of a playing card uh, by reciting a couple of lines of poetry. Let, let me give this a try. Uh, the poetry was, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. 
what playing card are you thinking of right now? Eight of clubs. Eight of cl Shut up. Did you see the interview? Yeah, yeah, Peaky Promise? Okay, because that's exactly what the guy says. That, that dude, dude, here, I, I, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to do it. Walk over to that computer. I, you don't have to actually do it. Uh, this guy's name was, uh, was uh, uh, he, he was a life coach. If you search for Coach, uh, coach Charles Doubleday, here, and so you search, you go Coach Charles Doubleday, and let's see if we can find the end. Oh, good, yeah, no, here he is. Here, look, this is, this is the exact interview I was talking about. Scam School, we are here at the Nomad Bar in Austin, Texas, and today we are talking to Coach Charles Doubleday. Now, before we went to break, you said something that kind of blew my mind. It sounded like you were describing, like, I mean, it sounded like mind control. Well, actually, it is. Our studies of neuro-linguistic programming have discovered deep structures in the human brain that can be accessed with linguistic triggers. We can actually put a thought into someone's mind. Like against their will. Yeah. Do you have any examples? Uh, we would read a poem by Robert Frost, the, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, and I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep. Then we would have them think of a card, and every time they would think of the eight of clubs. <laughs> so uh, one, one of the beautiful things was it turns out that, uh, that uh, Richard Garriott was a fan of the show, and he found himself in uh, quarantine in, uh, uh, I want to say, Baikonur, Kazakhstan, and uh, he uh, uh, decided that, wow, this would be the perfect thing to do from a very remote connection uh, from the International Space Station. And he performed it on his dad, and we have that on there. Uh, unfortunately, because it was such a pain in the ass to edit together 104 versions, because we wanted to make sure there was a long version and a short version, we also had to open up 52 different accounts for all of the variations of the expert's name. Uh, but the beautiful thing is that it's a gift that just lives out there all on its own. So, th so the answer to your question is the one I'm most proud of was not at all the most fun to do in any way. Any other questions? I know that we're, uh, we're a little bit tight today. Dude, well, if that's it. Uh, well, thanks, Brian, for coming out. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it was great hearing from you today. Yeah, you got it, Andy. All thanks right. so much, guys. Appreciate it.